body spec. So, um, yeah, I'm all in my usual graphics talk. Um, this time about making embedded less special with open source graphic driver. Um, yeah, a bit about me. I'm Luca. Um, I'm working at the kernel and graphics team at Pangotronics for those that don't now know me. Um, yeah, we are an open source consultancy doing all kinds of kernel stuff and bootloader stuff and stuff like that. Um, I also happen to be the maintainer of the Epnavif driver, which is the open source GPU driver for the Vivante GPUs, um, which was a lucky coincidence. So uh, I've started hacking on open source graphics with the Nuvo driver for NVIDIA GPUs in my spare time. Then I joined Pangotronics to work on embedded devices and as luck had it, um, clients were interested in getting graphics up and running on those devices without the hassle of having to deal with binary blobs. So yeah, um, yeah, and I do all kinds of Linux kernel stuff at Pangotronics, making sure that the upstream kernel is running on devices for our customers. <coughs> so what I'm trying to do here is uh, show a bit about how the open source drivers are helping us to make embedded less special and being special is always not so great because you don't get the mind share and the developer resources that come with being not special and just doing what everyone else is doing. And I'm also trying to give, give a bit of an overview of the graphics stack in Linux so you see how it all fits together. So yeah, I'm just talking about graphics output and graphics generation. There's a whole other topic about graphics input on socks like cameras and stuff. I'm not going to talk that much about. Um, so to get a bit uh, an overview of the audience, who of you have heard about those words? So OpenGL, <laughs> good. Vulkan, yeah, all the rage right now. KMS, good. <laughs> So pretty much everyone knows what I'm talking about. So yeah, OpenGL is just the standard graphics API with Linux and other systems. Vulkan is getting all the rage now with being a lower level uh, graphics API where the promise is that things get magically faster. That's not really true. <laughs> You're just sh shifting the responsibility for getting things faster to another party. Uh, and kernel mode setting is just the standard interface for display drivers. So where are we coming from in the embedded space? So typically with embedded devices, there, uh, there is some GPU vendors like Imagination with PowerVR, uh, Vivante with the uh, Vivante GC, whatever course and um, ARM with Mali, lots of generations. Um, all of those vendors just provided binary blobs for their devices because there's lots of special stuff or so they believe there's lots of special stuff in their drivers that makes them fast and better than the competition. Um, which might be true, but in most cases isn't really true because the embedded GPU vendors just don't have the uh, manpower to do all the OpenGL implementation work to a really nice degree. So basically you, you get what, what you did get with, when choosing a SOC in the embedded space. You've got a kernel driver, obviously, because uh, GPUs need to interface with all kinds of Linux kernel details like the memory management to get uh, memory allocated for the graphics buffers and uh, stuff like that. So you had to have a kernel driver and the GPL mandates that you have to have an open source kernel driver and all of those vendors basically complied with the GPL so there was no GPL violation but those drivers were usually very, very fat. 
So they had a classically they had a huge hardware abstraction layer, or so the vendors called it. But in reality, it was more of an OS abstraction layer because most of those vendors tried to be as independent from the Linux kernel as possible in order to maybe run on other operating systems, uh, but mostly to, yeah, not have to follow all of the interface changes in the Linux kernel. And the internals of the Linux kernel interfaces are changing quite rapidly. So they all built kind of a hardware or OS abstraction layer um, that made it really hard for them to have a lean and maintainable driver. And, and then there a large and cl closed source user space library that's actually implementing all those graphics APIs. So when you're trying to uh, write an application on your embedded system, typically you're talking to OpenGL and some kind of winnowing system API like EGL, and that's all abstracted away in the user space library and as there's the kernel user space boundary, there's no obligation to have the, this part of the driver open source and all of those uh, vendors took advantage of that. And, and just had a closed source user space driver, which also was a hassle if you're dealing with systems that you want to update or change things where the vendor is just providing you a pre-compiled library and if you're changing glibc or the compiler switches or something like that, it would all start to crumble away and the library wouldn't even fit in anymore. So that made integration of binary graphics really hard in the past. So we did some of this for our clients and it was not really an enjoyable experience in bringing up the binary drivers on modern and recent Linux systems. Um, but we had to do it because people want to run graphics and if the binary driver is all that's there, you have to do it. So, and last but not least, there were, were a lot of specialized uh, interfaces where all those vendors noticed that there's some gaps in the OpenGL specification. You could do things with their GPU cores more efficiently if you would do it the special way and they just added or bolted interfaces to the side of the OpenGL spec conformant driver part. And if you would like to run your system at the full performance and taking advantage of all the features that your system had, you had to use all those non-standard interfaces. So the applications that you wrote on top of that were really tied to the specific OpenGL driver implementation for that one vendor. You couldn't just take that application, even if it's standard OpenGL, and take that and run it on another system or even on your PC. So now getting into the uh, open source drivers, um, the base layer of the Linux kernel stack is the Linux uh, DRM subsystem which stands for Direct Rendering Manager, not Digital Rights Management. Um, and it has basically two distinct parts, which is there's a standard interface for display output hardware, so something that uh, takes the, the byte stream from your memory and converts it to something usable on your display which is your scan out engine or display engine, there's a standardized interface, which is kernel, the kernel mode setting interface. And that's pretty much all the same across every driver that's upstream. So there, there's obviously differences in the feature set that's supported by each driver, but uh, user space can discover those differences and then, yeah, make it all work on top of this interface. And then there's this custom iOctal based interface for graphics accelerators where pretty much everyone is cooking their own stuff. 
So <laughs> in the typical system, yeah, the base layer of the stack looks like this. So you have a driver for your display engine, which is driven by the KMS interface to user space. And then you have maybe a separate driver for your GPU, which would be, be the EdnaWiv driver in the IMX SOC and the IMX DRM driver for the display. Um, and the GPU drivers have some common parts in the interface, but most of it is just custom high octals. Um, on your typical desktop GPU, uh, that's not two separate drivers, but it's one driver providing both interfaces to the upper layer. So you would typically have your AMD or Intel driver that's, that has both the KMS interface for the display side and the IL octal interface for driving uh, the graphics GP accelerator part. So now the obvious question is, why don't we have a standardized interface for all the accelerated graphics stuff in the kernel? And the basic answer to that is that graphics APIs like OpenGL are huge. Uh, OpenGL is a huge state machine where you, each command you're doing or each API or AP call you're doing to your OpenGL is just mutating the state of the OpenGL state machine and then you're drawing or all your rendering operations are using this state. So those APIs are really, really huge and you don't want to support all of that in the Linux kernel or you can't even do it. So a large part of the ABI, APIs are implemented in user space and so basically you're splitting your GPU driver in half with having only the base stuff like memory management and getting yeah, the details how to talk to the hardware, how to make the hardware execute something in a kernel driver and then you have a big user space driver that's sitting on top of this. Uh, so so you, you're splitting the driver in half and basically every hardware is designed with some subtle or not so subtle differences. So each driver team basically chooses how to abstract those differences in the IOCTL interface and make it work efficiently. Because obviously accelerated graphics is all about performance, so each driver team basically comes up with an interface that uh, allows them to have minimal overhead between the user space driver part and what's in the kernel. Um, so for the user space part of the open source drivers, uh, most of it is in a single library project, which is the Mesa 3D project. And it's basically the Swiss army knife of open source graphics drivers. So it, it implements all kinds of APIs for the applications to use, like OpenGL or EGL or whatever, Vulkan, even OpenCL now for some graphics hardware, and also the user space part of the graphics driver. So there's hardware specific parts in Mesa. Um, so that's basically how it looks like. So. You have those interfaces and then Mesa as a library sitting on top of it and providing standard interfaces for applications to use. Um, so now we are going to zoom in a bit into this box. Very, um, this is a really, really simplified view of what's inside of Mesa. Mesa has a lot of layers and a lot of different stuff, but that's, uh, Colors are really off. Um, that's basically what's inside for a modern driver. So basically uh, in the middle you have the Gallium interface. Some of you may might have heard of this. So it's it's really nothing else than a defined driver interface where, where there's some standard operations that all those drivers are implementing. So Radeon SI for the AMD graphics, now, finally, Iris for Intel. Intel 
until recently used a totally different uh, uh, driver interface inside of Mesa for the classic driver. Now finally they are switching over to the Gallium interface so we can finally forget about all those other interfaces. Um, and then obviously the newer SOC drivers like Panfrost and Ednalift are also implementing the Gallium interface or parts of the Gallium interface. And on top of that interface, there, there's all this shared code that's used by all those driver projects to provide the standard APIs like OpenGL. So there's an OpenGL state tracker and there's a DRI, DRI2 is an, another internal interface inside of Mesa that's used to implement windowing system APIs like EGL, so to get a rendering context or a window where you can render into that's all handled by this part of the uh, Mesa library. Um, yeah, so as you can see, there's all those little drivers down there implementing the really hardware specific part and there's a large blob of shared code that's used by all drivers and all driver teams are contributing to this because yeah, obviously it's, it's open source so everyone is just, yeah, working on the shared code. So same as in the Linux kernel where you have some shared infrastructure and everybody is contributing to that and then you have those, yeah, hardware differences that are handled in drivers um, and that's what makes the, M or the open source drivers, in my opinion, better to handle because everyone is getting the same OpenGL behavior. So hardware, errata, and stuff like that aside, you basically get the same interface here, render independent. And for some numbers uh, inside of, or what makes up the, this graphic stack. So on the display side, those are just numbers I took yesterday. They're really coarse, but to give you an overview of how big those drivers are. So the display side of the IMX is about 3,000 lines of code. So obviously that's also using a lot of shared infrastructure in the Linux kernel, but that's what makes Linux great. You have a lot of shared infrastructure, so your driver hasn't, hasn't to be that big. And that's basically all what's needed to support all the features of the display engine. Then for the GPU driver, you have around 9,000 lines of code in the kernel, which is mostly uh, about memory management, scheduling jobs, when to run jobs, uh, making sure the GPU is in a state we want it to be, and things like that. Um, the Aetna with user space driver, which is what is below the Gallium interface in Mesa, is around 20,000 lines of code. So there's a bit more to that. But if you put this in perspective, uh, the OpenGL state tracker on top of that is around 400,000 lines to do something like that in a nice quality level. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, uh, that's really the meat to the driver where everyone is contributing to, where, where all those embedded drivers are also profiting from a lot and a lot of work done by both Intel and AMD who are contributing to those open source driver stacks with this amount of code. So if you look at this picture again and imagine it being to scale, this one would totally dwarf all the, of the other parts of the stack. Ah, uh, we'll get to that now. <laughs> so EGL um, sometime in the past did stand for embedded GL, but not really anymore. So it's just an acronym that nobody ever spells out. Um, <laughs> so in the classic world of uh, Linux uh, OpenGL support, you would have 
an OpenGL support for uh, doing actual rendering and you have a windowing system uh, integration which was classically based on X11. So the window system integration was GLX and that was part of the OpenGL library on Linux. And then someone discovered that there's more to um, uh, Linux than X11. So people wanted to run applications directly on their display hardware without the, the abstractions or yeah, the big X server in between. So that's when EGL came around. So that's basically a way a platform independent way to get a rendering context and some windowing abstraction for you to render your stuff into. So if you're talking about re uh, your application directly talking to KMS, it's the EGL platform on top of GBM, which is another really great acronym for generic buffer manager. So it doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, <laughs> but basically, GBM is just providing the glue between KMS and the EGL ABIs. So for EGL, you always need a platform window or platform context, and GBM is just providing that context on top of KMS. Yeah. So. With that in place, with, with being able to get a rendering context directly on KMS and having OpenGL in a sta pretty standard way available with the open source drivers, you, you could start and write applications directly on top of that. So that, that's basically what, for example, Q5 with the EGLFS backend is doing. So you, you're getting an EGL full screen for, I have a single application and it's running yeah, it's even, so even EGLFS has multiple backends again in QT, but that's really into the details. I don't want to go into that. So you get a single window on your KMS device and you can directly render your uh, stuff. Like Qt is using this for the QML uh, acceleration of GUIs basically. So it's using OpenGL, a 3D ABI to accelerate to the user interfaces basically. But it's still a lot faster than doing it on the CPU, so that's a good thing. So that's something you could do, but if you're talking about being less special, uh, yeah, having a single application that directly talks to KMS, which is also a pretty uh, big, a API to handle for a single application, that's still pretty special, right? Um, and then what if I want to have more than a single application on my embedded device? That's something that comes up lately. <laughs> so and one solution to that is Wayland. So at some point people uh, decided that X11 and the X server is just such a massive amount of old and crafty code that it's basically impossible to enable any new features that your shiny new display engine would support. So typically display engines in those socks are supporting stuff like putting a GUI plane on, on the base plane or on the pole output and then having a video plane on top or something like that. And you wouldn't need to do this on the GPU, but you could really do this on the display hardware, which is much more efficient. And it would have been a massive uh, hassle to implement this in X11. So at some point, people decided it's really a good thing to start over, and that's where the Wayland protocol basically started. So it's a clean slate design, and. It's also growing a lot of craft right now, <laughs> but it's a lot easier to implement new features there. So, and with that in place, you can, you have the Wayland Compositor, like Western or Gnome Shell. <laughs> um, 
And that's taking the part of the application that's directly interfacing with your display hardware. So everything that's to do with your display hardware is offloaded to the compositor and the compositor is handling the KMS interface, maybe even doing composition using OpenGL, but not necessarily. Um, and then you have a standard Wayland protocol to your applications. And then again, there's an EGL on top of Wayland implementation in Mesa. So you can just get a rendering context on Wayland. So, and at that point, uh, your application, which is probably what you're most interested in if you're building an embedded system, is just a Wayland application that's using other standard interfaces that are out there. So with a Wayland platform slotted in there, uh, you get a lot of benefits. You have no platform specific code on the application side anymore. So it's th the application doesn't need to care about if the system has multiple display outputs and it just render to one or be duplicated to both outputs or render something different on both outputs. It's something you can put in as a policy on the compositor side. And there's a lot of building pieces there like uh, plugins for Western again that decide how this policy decisions should be handled. And that's something you could easily do on your own. And the best thing about this is once you have a Wayland platform up and running on your embedded system and on top of the open source drivers, the thing just becomes like your modern Linux desktop. So at that point, you can just take your application, run it on a different embedded system or even on your uh, development host. And that's something that's really, really great for developer productivity because uh, now the application developers don't even need to know about the embedded system specifics, but can just develop their application on their usual desktop system and then transfer it to the embedded system. So obviously they still need to be aware about the performance limitations of an embedded system compared to a full desktop system. But from all the interfaces, it just is, looks the same. So up to this point, any questions? Can you go back a couple of slides to the EGL slide? It's like three slides. This yeah. one is good. <laughs> so there is EGL, and then there is OpenGL, and then there is OpenGL ES. Uh, OpenGL. It's super confusing. <laughs> OpenGL ES is not EGL, is it? No. Explain. <laughs> OpenGL ES, which stands for OpenGL Embedded System, so it's an embedded system profile from OpenGL. Uh, it's just, or was just a subset of the regular OpenGL. Um, so basically what we call desktop GL is also an interface that's going back to the early 90s with uh, SGI and the IRIX uh, graphics workstations. So that's where OpenGL originated. And there's a lot of stuff in there that maps pretty well to early 90s hardware, like stuff like doing drawing in individual triangles. So you would have, you, you, you still have in the Mesa library and all uh, OpenGL drivers that are uh, implementing the full desktop OpenGL profile, you still have interfaces like, uh, yeah, ABI calls that say, I want to draw a triangle. And for that triangle, your first point is this. Your second point is this. Your third point is this. So you have a lot, a lot of ABI calls just to do this kind of interme uh, intermediate uh, rendering. Um, and that's not really efficient. So 
Uh, it's not even how modern, modern hardware works anymore, but Mesa and other standards compliant drivers make it look like you can still do this and they emulate stuff internally to turn it into a hardware command for the GPU. Um, basically, modern GL is about keeping the GPU busy while you're preparing the next frame on the CPU. So you want to have it all done concurrently and you're building command streams with a lot of work where you specify what the GPU should do and then push it off and let the GPU do the thing. And that's how modern GL works. And OpenGL ES basically took this subset of OpenGL and made it into an embedded profile. So you don't have to implement all those crafty stuff from the early 90s. And then obviously they bolted on new features. So there's OpenGL ES 2, 3, and point releases. And EGL, and OpenGL itself will not give you something where you can output what you did render. So OpenGL is really only about specifying how you want to want your scene to be rendered on the GPU. And if you want to have it output to something, you obviously need to interface with a windowing system. If that windowing system is just your display driver, it's KMS, <laughs> uh, or it may be Wayland. And then EGL is the ABI for getting a handle or window on the windowing system for where you can put your OpenGL on top of to get it actually to show up somewhere. Um, you talked about how Wayland is well suited to embedded systems. Um, do you have a compositor you recommend and you use with success? Um, in most of our projects, we're using the reference compositor, which is Western. Um, mostly because it has some unique features. So um, there, there's a strong contender, which is WL Roots, which is basically building blocks for a compositor, um, which is really, really nice in my opinion. But there, there's some stuff missing from that that we are using. Uh, basically, the most important feature for us is to get the compositor out of the way, to just have the Wayland platform available for having standard interfaces to, for the application, but then have the compositor get out of the way. So if, if your application is rendering and it's just full screen, you, you just want the compositor to take the picture produced by the client application and directly pu put it on the scan out hardware. And that's something where Western is really leading right now with being able to transform the scenes and uh, trying to put stuff on the hardware capabilities of your display engine. That's missing from other stuff. But I think the uh, WL Roots guys are working on stuff like that. So that's what we are using. Thank you. Um, quick question, uh, for LLVM pipe, is there any work on that for embedded systems or like how does that fit in the, the picture here? Not really. So uh, LLVM pipe also needs uh, specific optimizations for the architecture. So using uh, intrinsics for vectorization, vectorization and that's mostly done on x86. So really there's, so currently, so currently like it just basically exists on x86 and there's no ARM ports or ARM64 ports or- It, it runs way. on ARM, uh -huh. so you, you can run it, but it's not really fast. So gotcha. it, it's, it's a good test to see how a standard <laughs> driver could look like, mm -hmm. but it's not fast. Okay, so. so it's not taking advantage of Neon and all the other stuff that's available on ARM systems. I uh, just want to say uh, thank you. I use uh, Edna Viv, so thank you for maintaining that. I have that on my Novena laptop and also the Bigabone AI. Um, uh, 
And I was remembering from the crowdfunding campaign, like something came about where they were, like, they were helping to fund the development, but I'm wondering if you could fill in some of the history of how Etnaviv came to be. Um, yeah, I think we didn't really see any of the funding. I okay. think Russell King said something like that, but I don't know really. Um, yeah, Etnaviv pretty much started as a hobby project. The, uh, Vladimir van der Laan just reverse engineering the Vivante GPU cores for fun. So he, he's really into reverse engineering and he did it for fun and yeah, basically made a basic working driver out of the, this reverse engineering effort. And that's the point where Pangotronics got involved. Uh, also. Christian Kmeiner did some work on bringing up the Aetna with driver on the IMX6. So there was something showing up on the IMX6. There was a lot of features missing and corruptions and stuff like that, but it was something that basically showed up on the screen. And that basically was the point when Pangotronics got involved uh, as, yeah, basically customers were asking for an open source solution. So our involvement started with a medical customer, which are, wanted to be able to, yeah, basically update the system in a consistent way for the next 10 years. So they said, oh no, having a binary blob of this size in the system is an uncon uncontrollable risk. So we want to have something open source and their requirements at the time were really modest, like just running a basic Qt5 GUI on top of the Etnavif driver. But they funded a lot of the early Etnavif work with bringing the kernel driver upstream. Mm -hmm. So this, yeah, took me the better part of a year <laughs> to get it all hashed out. And yeah, but Basically, it worked out pretty well. So Edna with us upstream since kernel 4.6, I think, or something like that. And we've never had to do a breaking change of the kernel user space ABI. So we've added some extensions for performance monitoring or just recently for the newest generation of GPUs, we had to add some features, but we've never had to do a breaking change of the ABI. You, you can just freely choose whatever kernel you want and run the Aetna with user space on top of it. So that's pretty nice. <laughs> has, um, has Avante um, given you any feedback or any, any, any interaction or <laughs> do they just not care? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've talked a bit with the guys from Vivante and there, there even was a manager there for some time who was pretty interested in the open source effort, but it got shut down from the boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, they basically they're saying they're not stopping us from doing anything like that, but they won't help us in either. So, yeah, the usual stuff with an open source project. <laughs> so, uh, which of the GPUs would you recommend which have a good open source driver and which are on the other side? Uh, garbage with blobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really garbage, but hey, I have some bonus slides. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. There. <laughs> so the current status of the uh, open source GPU drivers is basically free. To Trino was the first driver to be upstreamed of the embedded GPU pack. And it's a pretty stable and featureful driver at this point. I wouldn't really say that the Qualcomm uh, blob driver is crap, but obviously the open source driver is nicer. <laughs> and, and FreeTrainO is really, really stable. It supports a lot of GPUs. It just recently gained support for the Adreno GPUs on the IMX51, which is like a 15 year old design and it's still supported in FreeTrainO. Um, and recently, Google is investing in, uh, in the development of the free Trino driver for use in their Chrome OS uh, devices. So that's a pretty nice driver. Um, yeah, obviously, I 
can recommend Edna Lev. <laughs> yeah, I know you have different experiences. <laughs> but yeah, we <coughs> Edna Lev at this point is a pretty stable OpenGL ES2 driver. We didn't really work on OpenGL ES3 features for a long time because there was just no uh, customer interest in that. Um, but yeah, we, we are supporting the latest available GPU generations right now, so the code is going upstream right now. Um, we even had early access to really early silicon of the IMX8 and did some reverse engineering there. So <laughs> that was pretty nice. And yeah, obviously Adnalif has some commercial customers that I won't mention here. <laughs> that are paying for further development in that number and keeping it stable. So we, we didn't really work on a lot of features, but we, we worked on making it fast for the use cases that those customers are tar uh, targeting. <coughs> um, on the other hand, there's Lima, which is mostly a hobbyist project, I think, and yeah, it's not a really big community behind it because yeah, it's mostly used on really, really old, or the Lima driver supports the older generation um, Mali uh, graphics cores that are not really used on any recent devices with the exception of the pretty new Xilinx Sync MP. <laughs> so yeah, if you're using this chip, you're pretty out of luck, but, but there's an open source upstream driver now. So it's actually really good. It works, but yeah, there's not a lot of community behind it. <laughs> and then there's Panfrost, which is the driver for the newer generations of the ARM Mali uh, GPUs. And this one has still quite a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of community and a lot of developers working on this with Collabora joining in. and. Yeah, a lot of hobbyist uh, contributors doing some work and they're really, really fast paced with their feature work. So I expect to, this to be a really, really usable driver in the near future. So, yeah. And I've heard a lot of not so nice stories about the Mali support with the ARM driver. <laughs> but it, basically the same story everywhere with uh, binary blob renders if you're going outside of the feature set that support it you can talk to them and then maybe half a year or a year, year later you get some kind of support for your use case and maybe it's working maybe it's broken and then you do your cycle again and again while with open source drivers you obviously can just dive in and fix or extend whatever you like um, how's the state tracker for GLES 3 uh, yes, the, the state tracker supports pretty much all of the OpenGL versions. So uh, it okay. supports desktop GL and GLES 2 and 3. But obviously it's not exposing this level of OpenGL if the pipe driver below isn't supporting it. Uh, what, what about funky projects like, like GL4ES that's pretty much like super widely used, but it's like <laughs> uh, off? Uh, off doing its own thing. Sorry? Uh, do you know GL for ES? Like basically they emulate OpenGL on top of GL ES. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, not really a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no, but like, <laughs> like for a lot of embedded systems, it's widely applicable. Like. Yeah, so, so with the open source drivers, you basically get the desktop GL level that's supported by the hardware. So if you're running Ednavif, you get OpenGL ES2, but you're also getting desktop GL2.1 or something like that, because that's the level of support that's implemented in hardware. So you can just use that. So we, we are not restricting any of the ABIs or functionality in the open source drivers. You just get what the hardware supports. Um, I have another question. You mentioned uh, in the buzzword at the beginning, you mentioned Vulkan. <laughs> what's, <laughs> the what's the status in, uh, in Etnaviv, uh, in Mesa? What's the, 
Um, there's no plan really to support Vulkan at this point. So there, there's some base work or yeah stuff going on that may benefit Vulkan in the future. So something like we recently gained a new compiler backend that's based on Neo, which is the new compiler infrastructure inside of Mesa, which is also used for all the Vulkan uh, translation layers. Um, so that might benefit a Vulkan implementation at some point, but currently there's not really any applications uh, using Vulkan on the embedded systems. And as I said, Vulkan is really, really cool from the point of view of a driver writer because it really cuts down on all the state machine that makes op uh, OpenGL, which is those 4,000 lines of code that you've seen. So with Vulkan, you, you really slim down that layer, but also the application developer has to take a lot more responsibility about making things fast because the state tracker and the, the hardware driver below uh, is really taking care of a lot of performance optimizations where driver writers are doing the performance optimizations for their GPUs and with Vulkan there's no such layer anymore. So the application developers need to be much more careful in writing applications to really extract the performance of the GPU for it. So. Thank you. What do you think about Google's uh, GL on Vulkan, or GLES on Vulkan? Yeah, it's, it's a nice project. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, basically, uh, if you're doing a translation layer from any higher uh, abstraction layer like OpenGL, Vulkan uh, as a base layer for implementing such a translation layer is a pretty good choice if you have a good Vulkan driver. So. Uh, I don't think so, <laughs> yeah. So basically the Gallium ABI level inside of Mesa is pretty much uh, at the same abstraction level as Vulkan, so maybe you could learn something from the state tracker, but it's really different interfaces in it. So. I have one more. So do you know anything about Power VR, which is present in all these Beagle products and, and TI chips? Is, is anything happening on that? I uh, haven't heard anything going on there for a long time. So the, the thing that makes Power VR special again is that in contrast to all the other GPUs that are pretty much fixed function or have a fixed instruction set, Power VR is again running firmware on the GPU. So you're uploading firmware to the GPU and it defines the interface, how to interface with the GPU hardware core. So if you take different Power VR driver versions, they're totally changing the interface, how the driver is talking to the GPU. So can you implement an open source firmware for that, a free <laughs> software firmware, and then maybe, but maybe you can have a OpenGL in ES interface. Opinion, I think Power VR is just going to die down. <laughs> they they pretty much lost a lot of developers when Apple announced that they're not going to buy Power VR GPUs anymore. Their market capitalization tanked, and then they lost a lot of developers. So maybe the problem is going to fix itself in the future. <laughs> Another one over there. Uh, uh, one question about Panfrost. So you said uh, in the near future you think it will be stable enough. Uh, can you concrete what the near future means? One year, two years, five years? Uh, the really near future. So in less than a year. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks for your attention. Oh. <laughs> Mark has another one. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
about resource sharing on Etna Weave between different threads. Uh, when is that going to be upstream? <laughs> also in the very near future. <laughs> I'm not going into details anymore. <laughs> Thanks. Cool.